Hello and welcome everyone back. We are joined once again today by Simon Andrews. Um, I've mentioned before his Mobile Fix newsletter um, and you know him from several of our past interviews where we've talked on um, the platforms, we've talked on technology and trends in China and today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the future of digital advertising and more specifically ad targeting. Simon, welcome back. Hey Tyler, good to be here. Thanks for joining again. And I know that this is one topic in particular that sort of threads its way in and out of a lot of different things that we've talked about. But today we're going to kind of hone in on digital advertising. And of course, it's it's going to change here soon. I think there's huge changes coming. We we had um, an event planned that didn't happen because of the COVID crisis, but ad tech perfect storm. If you think about GDPR, California privacy rules, the demise of third party cookies, the IDFA, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff changing and that is disruptive for everybody in the marketplace. That's right. And you mentioned uh, both of the privacy regulations, both in the EU and the state of California here in the United States. And uh, I find it interesting because a lot of this centers around user data privacy. Um, however, I think in the, the world of advertising, what's talked about a lot is the death of the cookie. And I don't necessarily associate the average consumer with someone that is, you know, worried about cookies, particularly, they might be worried about their data. But is, is this kind of user data? And when we talk about cookies, is this demanded by consumers? Or is this something that's the result of platforms maybe positioning themselves in a battle against each other? I think when you talk to consumers about things like cookies, they don't really understand it. You know, when we've had conversations, you know, we used to talk about things about location, people were very relaxed about those things. They didn't like the idea that a Walmart or a John Lewis was following you around the internet using cookies. Because they'd all seen that had an instance we all have where you look at a product and you see ads for it for weeks afterwards, even though you might have bought it or you've lost interest. So that sort of lazy advertising that cookies enabled retargeting is something that does tend to irritate people. But I don't think they really see it as a privacy thing in the same way that the GDPR in California is. So I think you're right, the two things do get conflated a bit. And I think um, you're also right, the platforms, it suits them in some ways to have these two things together. You know, Apple have a big thing about privacy and they've made it, you know, uh, something they run ads about and make it core part of their platform. And then dismantling um, the IDFA in mobile apps and taking cookies away from um, Safari feel like that's more to do with their business and other people's business than it is about consumers. Uh, you, you, you may very well be right. I, I, I certainly know that that is something that uh, has been the topic of many discussions specifically, um, some in which even different members of these platforms have testified uh, in front of both either the EU government or the United States government. And they sort of point fingers at, the, at each other a bit uh, speaking specifically about Facebook, pointing fingers at Apple. And I think of all the big names that we can think of, Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon, which, which is most likely to benefit from the removal of this, this third-party data or third-party cookie targeting? Um, and which one is most likely to, uh, I guess, uh, see a disruption from it? Well, I, I think generally they all do well. If you think about it, if you took, you know, lay out the, the market you know, there's a big chunk of money in Google, big chunk of money in Facebook, in Apple, less so Amazon growing. And there's a, you know, a small chunk left, which we think of display. So the money that's spent on websites, you know, outside of the um, wall gardens, you know, they're going to suffer because cookies, I think, are more important to them than the other platforms. When you go to Facebook, you're logged in. When you go into all the other ones, you're logged in from there. The real what I think has the issues is Google, because a lot of Google business is, you know, they're serving ads across the whole of the internet. Um, and cookies obviously impact that. They're the people who are making the, you know, all the driving in terms of what the alternatives might be. So they've got the Sandbox initiative, testing out different things. The latest one is Flock. So looking at cohorts, etc. So they seem to be quite keen to find alternatives. Um, I think they recognize they have more to lose than the others. In terms of beneficiaries, I think it's hard to go. I think Amazon keep on growing, but their benefits is because they've got the best attribution. Amazon show you an ad, me an ad, then look at what we've bought, 
and work out, you know, has that ad been effective? So that drives the value of advertising up. I think Apple is interesting because Apple doesn't play really in advertising to any great sense. Obviously, it has search ads on the App Store, which is a very healthy business for app developers. Um, but I think that, you know, they maybe have plans to get back more into this. And, you know, by removing some of the building blocks from the competition, you could argue it makes it easier for them to come up with some other solution. We haven't seen what that might be yet, but I guess it sort of makes sense for them to do something. Yeah, it, it does make sense. And I, I think it, it is something that um, even if nothing else, I like. I think that they like having it hover over their business as an option. The same as um, maybe even a search engine, as we talked about uh, a couple conversations ago, the, the idea that they could build something um, to replace uh, something that maybe, and once again, that Google has provided. Um, but one of the questions I think is really interesting about this is we, there's a lot of talk about uh, the cookie and what's going to happen to it. And uh, what other forms of targeting can maybe take its place. But I, I guess the next question really is, what, it, is there really value in third-party cookies? Good, Google did their study and um, you know, the decrease in value that they showed inside of their information, I'm not sure that they can be a trusted resource on the topic. Um, but even if so, uh, personalized targeting is, is sort of dictated based on the fact that it's available. Um, if it goes away as a form of targeting that you can purchase as an advertiser, does that value basically uh, kind of buoy everything else up? Meaning, you know, isn't the cost of an ad really related to the, you know, the value that it provides and the value of what other options are available? So I guess, what is the impact of a third-party cookie on the value of an ad? Well, I think that is a big, topic now and everyone's sort of debating this we saw an academic last week talking about you know loss of value of 50 to 70 percent because cookies have gone from there but that sort of just imagines that just happens in, you know without conversation factors other people will step in with different ways of doing it lots of work around id initiatives so can i recognize tyler because of the you know how his browser is configured and which fonts he has etc from there the fingerprinting, lots of people playing around with that. Google sort of encouraging that. Um, but you can still advertise, I can advertise with Condé Nast and I know what I'm going to get with Condé Nast even without any third party cookies. So the environment and context it has always been important, maybe that comes back in importance. If you think about what cookies enable, a lot of it is dumb stuff, like just following someone around who's looked at your shop and following them around in different places. It allows, you know, but really the um, sabotage in the economics for a lot of publishers. So you can talk to someone, okay, I want to reach New York Times readers. I don't want to pay New York Times prices though. So I'll drop a cookie on, run one ad, drop a cookie, and then I'll find them in um, Yahoo Mail or on eBay, cheap, cheap as possible. So a lot of the value that um, you know, publishers deserve by aggregating valuable audiences, they don't get because third party cookies enable them to go elsewhere. So you sort of feel that there'll be some balancing to go on um, because prices in the World Gardens will sort of, you know, be unaffected, you know, it maybe isn't as big a storm as we've anticipated in terms of prices, and people aren't going to pay more than they, you know, is worth their while. So we'll have to wait and see. Attribution is one thing, though, one element that that ability, I showed Tyler this ad 30 days ago, and Tyler's bought this, and that depends on the third party cookie. That, you know, does underpin a lot of the value. How true, valuable that is, is debatable. If you saw a mobile banner the size of your fingernail on an app 30 days ago, has that really influenced your purchase or not? So maybe we just get some more scrutiny and people a little bit more sensible that without the easy option of third party cookies, we start to think more carefully, what are we doing? How do we measure it? And is it really valuable? Yeah, and I think that that's a really important question to ask. And I think that um, one of the things that may have been lost over the last uh, several years is with the advancement of a lot of the different attribution and tracking um, tools and devices and all the different technology that's available, I do think that there may be a laziness in asking, what is the value of this audience? And do I really believe in it? Do I believe these metrics? Because I think you could argue that even without cookies, that digital advertising still has the best form of attribution of you know, you think about previous forms of advertising, whether it's billboard or television, and it is a bit disingenuous to, 
suggests that without cookies, digital advertising becomes this thing that's much harder to track and, and get attribution from, um, from the standpoint of when you think about how a consumer actually buys and with the loss of things like cookies and uh, Apple Safari already on mobile, um, I'm not sure that we've got this pretty picture of attribution that marketers like to paint sometimes. So is, is this something that our marketers are actually going to lose ROI from this, this lack of targeting, or is this something that um, may ultimately make marketers smarter? Well, yeah, I think you make a good point that you know, digital is held to a much higher level of accountability than traditional is. You spend $10 million on a TV campaign, and you've got no real clue whether it's had an effect or not. You can do brand studies and stop people walking down the street in Los Angeles. Do you remember this commercial? Yeah, that's not very scientific compared to what we can do digital. But we have these very different standards. So I think that people can look at digital. How do I try and work out what's having an effect or not? You know, I can look at brand metrics as well as performance in terms of clicks. I can look at people who visit my store versus people seen as. There are lots of tools out there. And I think, you know, we would hope that the smarter people doing the cleverer things will rise up as um, you know, more of the um, uh, poorer work gets pushed out of the way. And I, I think that one of the things that you brought up just a moment ago that I think is really interesting is um, being able to ask yourself the question of, you know what you're getting if, you're, if you buy through the New York Times or Condé Nast. And I publishers, it's an interesting position to be in right now because they're asking themselves, if the third party cookie goes away, am I going to lose revenue? In in reality, the publisher should be in a much stronger position with something like this being gone, like you had shared. But I think it's really hard to talk about programmatic advertising without talking about kind of the elephant in the room that's often discussed. And that is both fraud and waste. And this year, a trend has been uh, big brands pulling away uh, dollars and even contracts from agencies and bringing things in house. And I think that's called for a lot more questions about, well, where are our dollars? Where are they going? And I think that one of the things that we found out is that um, they go a lot of different places and there seems to be a lot of finger pointing. Uh, but I'm curious as to um, what do you make of this? Is, is this a, massive um, uh, amount of waste and fraud that's occurring? Uh, will it get better? What's your take on it? Well, I think it's, it's a really interesting topic, but um, just a little bit of context. You know, I don't know if all your sort of subscribers know, but in the UK, about a year, about six months ago, um, the, the Advertisers Trade Union, similar to the four A's you've got in the States, we've got um, ISBAR. And they worked with PwC to report on looking at the programmatic um, uh, industry and look at wastage, et cetera. And they find that over half the money that advertisers spent doesn't get to the media owners. It gets spent on different tech people. And that's fine because lots of people add value from there. But it's unclear quite, you know, if everyone understood that. It found that some sites, some brands were advertising on 400,000 different websites. So you saw that, wow, okay. You know, why are you doing that? And he also found out that some 15% of the money just disappears. No one knows really. PwC, the world's best top four accounting company, can't work out where this has gone. These are all, you know, big kosher advertisers in the UK with smart people working for them, and 15% just disappeared. And I noted last week that six months on, and nothing's changed. I can't imagine any other industry where 15% of the value could disappear, and no one seems to care. But if you think back, you know, leaving that aside, if you think about the publishers, you know, so great publishers have always had a skill of producing good content, which aggregates a valuable audience to sell that to advertisers. And we've lost that because this idea that, you know, the New York Times, I can find their readers somewhere else. So you have a situation, if I buy the newspapers in London or in New York, they're full of ads for brands that we've all heard of. If I go to the same website, or the mobile website, those brands are not there, and they've got cheap programmatic fillers. You know, because the waterfall is just the only people who are available to spend on the Guardian, New York, less than New York Times, but you know, just not very good ads there. So you have a, you know, the industry has got this problem of um, we're taking money away from the people who deserve it and spending elsewhere. I think that comes to an end. And people starting to realise that's not good. You don't need four hundred thousand websites, and if you're doing that and you're not in the New York Times or Wall Street Journal or um, the London Guardian. And maybe something's wrong with that from there. 
And I think we also see that publishers are getting smart about using their first party data to you know, understand their audience better and you know, get value through their understanding of their audience. Yeah, I always find it a very interesting discussion because the the discussion of you mentioned the the fifteen percent just disappearing. I remember several years ago the Guardian bought their own ad inventory, and in the worst case scenario, they were getting only thirty pence back on the pound or something like that. Yes, yeah. And so, and, and, yeah, some of that money is spent on you know legitimate technology, which helps you know improve the you know the outcomes. Um, but it's not clear that everybody in that process understands that. And the Guardian, you know, went out to find out for themselves. And I show lots of other people, you know, through the ISBAR report, realized that, you know, their money wasn't being spent in the way they perhaps thought it would be. So, you know, that recognition will hopefully, you know, wash out in better practice. But we've heard very little publicly from any of the players in the marketplace, the brands, the agencies, or anybody, on this 15%, which is a bit worrying. It, it is, because... It- one of the things that I think has been present for a long time in programmatic is this sort of allegation of massive fraud. And it sort, it sort of mirrors the conversation about uh, the, the, the use of performance enhancing drugs in sports, where you have a portion of people that say everyone in respective sports are on these performance enhancing drugs. Then you have the naysayers that say, oh, it's just a couple bad apples that are uh, on these performance enhancing drugs, but the reality is there's probably something in between there where there is a percentage of athletes that are um, doing things that are against the rules. And I think that probably the same thing is occurring in digital advertising where there is a presence of fraud that has become, uh, I guess, grandfathered into many of the practices that occur. So I, I guess if we fast forward five years, are we are we looking at another publishing uh, association or another major publisher that has done this again and found that there's a missing 15% or is there something that's going to come along and kind of sort this out? Well, you would have to, the problem is, yeah, because the industry is so big in terms of, you know, it's a billion dollar industry because there are so many, you know, bits of plumbing and access points. It means that people, you know, bad actors can do well from this. And the story after the 2016 election, I think it's Macedonia, you know, you know, small European country, one village was full of people with Ferraris because they were basically running, you know, dodgy Facebook ads, driving traffic to pages with Google ads on there and making lots of money. The same, there's guys who make, you know, put Spotify playlists together and get, you know, invent a band. And you know, there are things that people do, to, you know, to cream some money off and that adds up to a significant chunk from there. I think that in the same way that if I'm a, you know, board of any Fortune 500 company, you know, I've got some um, regulations, some, some, some process to make sure money is spent properly, you would hope that starts to play in this space as well. And what has really happened is that programmatic has emerged in the last five years, and it's been a black box people don't quite understand. And people have been happy to say, okay, yeah, go off and do that, you know, magic. I think people are now sort of questioning quite what's working, what isn't working. And the, because the cookies take away one element of that, maybe that's part of the, you know, the questioning that has to happen, that um, you know, people insist on less waste and are more conscious of doing things properly than the new fashionable way that they don't quite understand. Five years forward is hard to call, though. Yeah, five years forward is hard to call. One of the things that has been present for hundreds of years, if not if we go back even further than that, and that is the three-way exchange that seems to provide value to all three parties, the users, uh, the publishers, and the advertisers. And that is advertising is a way to provide content uh, at little or no cost. And one of the things that I think that is interesting about this is if we can create a transparent chain between the advertiser dollar and then the publisher revenue extracted from uh, being able to display those ads, um, what role does advertising play in publisher monetization, both models and percentage of revenue moving forward? I guess if you're a publisher, it's a fair time to ask yourself the question, is digital advertising still an effective way for me to monetize my, my content? And if, if not, what, what is the alternative? There really hasn't been uh, anything at scale. You can, find all the examples of subscriptions and 
uh, a lot of product sales and things along those lines. But the ad model has persisted for such a long time and there, there seems to be a reason. Do you think that that is likely to change? Well, I, I'm just as optimistic about advertising as you are. The most valuable companies in the world are advertising companies. Google is an advertising company, Facebook is an advertising company. My friend Benedict Evans did a study that um, Amazon probably makes more profit from its advertising than does from its um, retail. When we talked about Apple. So the biggest companies in the world are driven by advertising. It's a business model that's been around for a long time. It works incredibly well because brands find a way of telling you and I about the new laptop, the new car, the new holiday destination which is valuable to us. Um, in doing that, they fund content for next to nothing for us, which is valuable for us, it keeps publishers going. So that trinity works incredibly well. Um, the problem is, you know, the subscriptions, so Netflix is great on subscriptions, New York Times great on subscriptions, but you know, that isn't a model that I think is sustainable for, for many people, because people, especially as we look into difficult times following the COVID crisis, you know, people don't have money to spend lots of subscriptions. And if you offer them a free version with advertising, generally they'll take that, that model. I do think that if you're a publisher, though, you can enhance your advertising by taking some element and, you know, having your customers, your readers, um, your users register with you so you've got more data on them that you're not going to use in a way that isn't privacy um, proper. You're only going to use it on that site, that first part data, that's really valuable. And I think you're seeing a lot of the publishers have a subscription model, which is great. They have uh, this level of registration, which helps them enhance the advertising model as well. One thing I think you have to watch out for, you see very good publishers, you know, selling one of their apps is it's great because it's ad free. I don't think we should promote ad free things as being the better than the non ad um, versions, because it's, it's a model that works for everybody, I think, when, when done properly. Yeah, I, I very much agree with you in, in that respect. And I, and I, one of the topics, or I guess philosophies that you're familiar with, actually, I think I, I maybe got turned on to it reading an article that you had included in one of your newsletters a long time ago. It is this, uh, this philosophy that we're always in periods of bundling or unbundling. And you'd mentioned the uh, idea that publishers could begin having registered users or logged in users and then use that data, manage the privacy themselves, and then uh, use that connection to their audience to continue to market to them, bring them back, create great content, things along those lines. And I think that what we're seeing now is um, an opportunity for publishers to begin to take back control of a lot of things that I think that they to collectively maybe outsourced in a lot of respects, Un bundled together these things that maybe they don't understand and kind of push them out the door. And I think now publishers are looking at things like their ad inventory and hearing things about cookies and saying, how much of this do we understand and do we control? And I think they realize they'd like to control a lot more of it. So do you see this as a trend with publishers taking and breaking apart a lot of the things that they maybe previously outsourced to ad tech or third parties? I think so, but it's slightly hampered because one of the problems that is publishers have been hit so hard the past few years, you know, they've reduced the size of their teams. And what we find is they've kept the, you know, the creative part, the journalists or whatever from there, and they tend to have less commercial people because they've outsourced it. And what we find is a lot of publishers don't have the smarts in-house to really be able to take advantage of this. I think there's a general trend, yes, you know, they'd like to take more control. Um, unfortunately, people to do it for them are the people that let, let go a year or two ago. So there's a bit of change to be done as you find the talent to help you make the most of that because the easy option of you know, outsourcing it has proved to be you know, less than ideal in many cases. Yeah, I think, I think that that's, <laughs> I think you're right on about that. And I, I guess that begs a question, if we look into the future, are ads bought and sold programmatically, or do we have something that we think is slightly different or better? Well, I, the reason programmatic, it's come, I was looked at, the, there's two things you can do with programmatic advertising. You can be more efficient or more effective. What's happened is more effective, okay, what can I do smarter to actually find more people? So we used to use Nike as an example. So I want to find people who are aged between 16 and 35, who like basketball, living in, da, da, da. Yeah, I'll be really efficient to try and find those people. Really, sorry, really effective to try and find those people. Oh, I just need to spend my money quicker and cheaper than I'm doing now. 
So that's um, going to the efficiency model. And of course, if most of the agents have gone on the efficiency model, it helps you spend money you know, more cheaply. I think if you, we need the tools of programmatic to handle the scale that's out there. It's finding ways of doing that smartly. So things, for instance, private marketplaces where you might strike a deal with a Condé Nast or a News Corp or um, you know, a big publisher, you know, an owner of lots of good content. And you, you might deal programmatically, but you're doing it in a way that you set the parameters beforehand. So you're not totally open to any ad turning up. You're not um, you know, totally open to appearing on any website. You've actually drawn some markers which actually suit your brand. And I think that, that taking back control is smart for agencies and it's smart for publishers as well and for advertisers. And I think that you're right about that. And, you know, you mentioned kind of markers and this sort of marks kind of the end of, of this topic. I, I was able to get through quite a bit of information on here. We scored, sort of scanned both the, the beginning of things right now where we're talking about cookies, but maybe I guess looking at the, uh, just the complexity and the nuance that exists within, within this space. It's, it's sort of an imperfect uh, ecosystem. And so we're getting a lot of imperfect solutions. But I didn't know if you had anything else to add on this topic before I let you go. I think it is an imperfect market, but it's a lot better than before we had digital and the ability to target people in the way we can now. You know, the old fashioned models, you know, Lord Leverhulme, you know, 50% of my money was wasted. Um, there's still an element of that, but you know, we've got much more certainty now. And I think it's rather than 50%, it's maybe we know about 80%, et cetera. So we've made, we're making progress. We should be proud of the progress we're making. Excellent. And so Simon, where, where can our listeners follow along uh, and get more information about these topics from you if they're interested? And where can they learn about the various things that you have going on right now? So the best thing is fix our newsletter, which is on a Friday and a Wednesday. Um, and if you go to addictivelondon.com, you can sign up for fix so you can read past issues um and um go as deep as you like is there anything interesting you've got coming up in the in the future i know you've uh, been involved in several events uh, events are a weird thing these times but is there anything else on the horizon that you'd like to turn our listeners on to well we're very interested in new tv and we're going to do some events some online events in january looking at what's happening in the streaming marketplace and what's happening with movies and cinema we've got some good guests lined up we've signed up um, some people from sony pictures Lord Putnam, who's a very big player in the sort of UK film industry. Um, so that will happen in January. So we're looking at doing more of those you know, deep dives about different subjects. And the webinar, an hour's webinar with a good panel feels like a good way of doing that. So we'll be doing more of that as we get into next year. Excellent. Well, thanks again, Simon. We really appreciate you joining us. And we hope to have a chance to chat again sometime soon. It's a pleasure. I appreciate it, Tyler. Take care.